Hey guys, so I got asked two things or got two requests this week. One was a long video with Connor. <laughs> And the second was a video about how I became a trainer. So I thought that both were kind of overdue. So I thought I would do that. Um, first of all, I was married at 17. Oh. And so Dave and I have been married over 14 years now. And when I first married him, I pretty oh. much learned everything bird training wise from him. So he was my mentor. And then at a certain point, I kind of broke off from that. Oh. And even though Dave and I have the same um, fundamental values when it comes to training, we do train differently. So he's more likely to push and make huge leaps and strides forward, where I'm more likely to be the turtle and take the slow but progressive route. Um, so we do have different training styles. We also do have different things that we enjoy training. I really enjoy training tricks and just working on my relationship with a bird and trust and bonding. And Dave loves doing flight training and anything related to shows. So <clears throat> we kind of have a different aspect there. However, we love training together. So I feel like we really complement each other because of our differences, um, yet we have the same goal. So we're able to watch each other train and really help fill in the gaps or help each other along. So it works really well. Um, when I first met Dave, when we first got married, he had budgies and Linus the umbrella cockatoo. And that was it. So our very first bird together was Bondi, our rose-breasted cockatoo. And uh. Dave's whole philosophy with getting Bondi was that he had always wanted a Galah and he <laughs> thought that it would help me to raise a baby bird so that I could get to know body language without being intimidated because I know 100% in my being that a baby bird is not trying to kill me. And so I'm more uh, willing to relax in my body language towards that animal and uh, be perceptive to learning. So Bondi is our first bird together. We took her everywhere. She's the only bird we've ever done harness training with. We didn't know about free flight when we got her, um, but luckily we did everything right along the way of raising her. So we've always been huge advocates for keeping parrots flighted. We've always loved showing our birds flighted in our shows. Um, I just think a bird in flight is one of the most beautiful things. And the more you can show that to people, the more that they can appreciate and advocate for that as well. So we've always loved that. Uh, Bondi has been in the show forever. She is our most social bird. We couldn't get permits for uh, her right away. So when we went and did a cruise ship, we did the first few months without her. And my mom actually raised uh, her for part of her life. So she is incredibly bonded to my mother as well. And we left my mother with our original Taming Training and Tricks uh, DVD uh, courses, which is all beginner, uh, intermediate, and advanced trick training. And trick training, just so you guys know, is just bond building. It's just making a great relationship between you and your bird. That's all trick training accomplishes. So yes, it teaches your bird like cute little tricks and that part's fun, but the real uh, core of trick training is to make a relationship between you and your bird that is just amazing. So that is why we advocate trick training as well. So my mom actually did <laughs> like all of taming training and tricks with Bondi um, and then yeah, after Bondi, we uh, had gotten three macaws, two of which we trained for David uh, Copperfield. And these were two blue and gold macaws and one uh, military macaw. And I was so intimidated because yes, I had worked with Bondi, I had raised her and I was very comfortable with her, but there's a huge size difference between a rose-breasted cockatoo and a macaw. So um, I was freaked out. I didn't know how to hold them. Everything just like that I learned with Bondi went completely out the window. And I was kind of one of those uncomfortable, like I'll hold it on my arm so I can kind of hold it far away. I was just super awkward. I didn't know what I was doing. <laughs> um, I still remember my brother-in-law like giving me a really hard time about that because I was just, I was so nervous. Um, but then I learned with these guys. So these guys taught me, I feel like more than I ever taught them. And uh, it was Jersey and Chaco. We had them on the island of Saipan where we did flight training with them. We did a show with them. They did come to us clipped, um, which was one of our first experiences with getting a bird, thinking that people would ship a bird flighted realizing they don't and they clip uh. it right before unless you're really really clear which apparently we were not um 
So anyways, Jersey and Chaco were my absolute loves. And we took them out to David Copperfield's Island oh. and trained them out there. And they did amazing. And they were just incredibly happy. And I felt okay about it. They were living on an island <laughs> uh, oh. in the Bahamas. And they were able to be outside 24-7. So I could not... Oh. I couldn't ask for more for their life. So that was really, really amazing experience. Hard though, very, very hard. Um, that was probably my, that was actually my very first experience training uh. birds for somebody else. Um, and since uh. then I've done it a lot, but never with a baby again. So training a baby uh. bird and then giving it to someone, ah, that really, that's just... I don't quite wow. have the heartstrings for that. Um, I find it difficult with adult birds, even when I know I'm having them for a chunk of time. Wow. I still find it hard. So doing it with a baby, I grow a little too attached. So wow. I, I don't know if I would be able to do that again or not. Um, but baby birds are amazing, so I'd probably be talked into it. I know Dave would jump on that. So anyways, after Jersey and Chaco, wow. we also worked with a military macaw named Cash originally and his nickname and pretty much former name uh formal name became uh Crash because we did some flight training with him and he was really amazing uh, because we were able to prove to people uh, because we free flight trained him that clipped birds could fly because that's a really uh well-known misconception is that oh I'm gonna uh, clip my bird so it can't fly away and that's just bs so a little bit of wind and your bird is like 50 miles down and four days away from oh. something else. So a lot of our free flight clients come to us because oh. their bird accidentally got out. It ended up like 50 miles away. Oh. They don't always have happy endings, but people usually come to a fork in the road where they're like, I can either clip my bird or I can do flight training so that if this happens again, there's a 95% chance my bird can make it back to me. So a lot of the times when birds get outside and then they fly away it's not because uh, they don't love you it's not because um they never wanted to be with you anyway it's because they don't have the skills to come uh, back um not only that but a lot of people don't desensitize their birds to outdoors so if you don't have your bird um going on walks with you on a harness uh, or going out in a carrier and just experiencing what your backyard sounds like or going out into an outdoor aviary um whatever it uh, is if they don't experience that at all and they're just an indoor bird the first time outside and it just happens to be that they got out, wow. you're doomed. The desensitization is like insane. It's just stimulus overload for these guys. Um, plus they don't have the skills wow. to come back. And especially a clipped bird, it's even uh, wow. worse off and more vulnerable because it just can't maneuver like a fully flighted bird. So um, that one's a toughie. So it was really cool with Crash to be able to, I mean, we have beautiful photos of him flying and he's clipped. So <laughs> he was able to go really far because uh, we just chose windy days to show that he could actually make it uh, really, really far. Um, so that's really important to me. I obviously am a huge advocate for not clipping. Um, I just think a bird has a better chance and is just a healthier individual if they're not clipped. Uh, so that's my whole thing. I won't go getting on a, what do they call it? A pedestal about it or something. Uh, so progression from there, um, we started, Dave and I really wanted to start adopting birds um, because we felt bad that we had purchased all of ours as youngsters. So we tried adopting a rosebreast cockatoo named Ace and we took him on tour with us and he got sick, I wanna say twice, but it was like, it wasn't just a little bit of a runny nose, it was full blown almost died sick. Um, and it just, I can't handle, major health issues like that emotionally I was a wreck and so um uh. we just realized that the travel and the stress from the travel if they if the birds are not brought up in our lifestyle uh. it was a no-go it was like every bird was going to experience this um it was just bad so that is why we no longer adopt uh. or rescue birds into our own uh, family and keep them or bring them on tour. We I do stints um, of working with birds when I know that I'm home oh. for a chunk of time. So that's it. <laughs> um, as far as like truly how I became a trainer, I got to a point where I wanted to test my own skills and my own knowledge. So I had felt like I learned as much as I could from, from my husband oh. and I got to a point where I wanted to experiment. Oh. And so Oftentimes when we were paid to work with a client's bird or a client, 
I would say, I would see another bird of theirs and I would say, can I work with that bird? Could I just have it for a certain amount of time? Or I would just go over and start working with it. And the clients were like, okay. And they didn't really have any expectations of what I was gonna do, but there were certain things that I saw like Jaime the Hyacinth had a horrible shoulder habit. As soon as you would oh. pick him up, he was just right to the shoulder. And having a huge hyacinth on your shoulder is not the best idea when you don't know its intentions. And so oh. I wanted to break the shoulder habit, which meant I had to teach this bird to stay on my hand and let me hold its feet. So it was oh. it was really fun to be able to do these different challenges with these different birds. Also a thing with Jaime is that he wouldn't eat any fresh oh. food. So that was really fun to be able to accomplish that. Um, and then Storm. Storm was incredibly obese. And Storm was actually a bird that Dave wanted to train. So Dave offered to train Storm, brought him home, was working, and I like couldn't help myself. And I took him out and I started working with him. So one of our things, um, at least one of Dave's things, is he, he believes like whatever trainer starts a train, like training something specific, a training a behavior should finish that behavior. I break that rule a lot. Um, as you guys have seen in my past videos, I break that rule a lot. I'm a very impatient person when it comes to like, I don't know. I, I will tell Dave, I'm like, oh, work with, work with this bird. It's only like two minutes. And he's just so busy. He doesn't do it. So then I do it. So, um, even if I know it's in the best interest of everyone, if Dave does the training, I get all like anxious, excited, impatient. I just do it myself. Um, so with Storm, it was the same thing. I was just excited. I had never worked with an Amazon parrot before, so I jumped in and I just took over. And so, and so that one was really great. Storm was an incredibly obese 35-year-old Amazon at the time. Uh, and he not only got into amazing shape, but I free flight trained him and completely changed his diet. So he was actually on hamburger as a diet. It was bad. Um, and he is one of my favorite projects today. He is so much fun. So that was a really, really great project and learning experience for me. During that process, if you guys go back on YouTube, which it might just be painful to watch, <laughs> but I was asking other trainers when I changed his diet, he switched so instantly that it actually freaked me out. Um, and I had called other professional trainers to come to my house and make sure he looked okay, make sure I was doing things correctly, just to kind of like oversee um, how I was doing and I was fairly confident, but I really needed that reassurance from other trainers that like, yeah, you're doing it right. Everything's looking good. Um, so I was constantly seeking that. I was even writing online in some forums to some people who were just specialized in Amazons. And I was like, whoa, what do all this craziness mean? And I still um, refer to Amazons as like police cars because their body language is just like sirens going off. Their eyes pin, their tails flare, the like poofiness happens. They start talking and chattering like, oh my gosh, they have so much going on that you're like, whoa, what are they telling me? Um, so Storm was a great project. We did our one day miracle series where we went into homes of 12 people and worked with them for one day and, uh, and just like reversed whatever problem they were having in one day, which was really amazing. And the only one that I walked away feeling like, oh, I don't think that they can make progress from here was Rasta. And he was an Alexandrian parakeet, incredibly, um, just severe fear and aggression and his owner was an 11 year old boy. So I felt like he needed a lot more time and a lot more patience than the average person could give him. So I actually offered for that family if I could take Rasta and work with him and I worked with him for an entire summer and then sent him back and they were thrilled and could actually make progress. So that was a really severe case but I just felt like I wanted to give them kind of what we had promised, like all that progress or a point where they could keep going from. And uh, and that's always my goal with every bird I work with is just to get it to a point where now the bird and their owner can work in a really healthy place and like progress from there. That's, that's kind of my goal when I'm working with other people's birds. Um, I want to say after Rasta, who was after Rasta? Do you remember? <laughs> we got our three macaws at the same time. We got Cressy as our very first free flight bird. We got Bandit as our second free flight bird because we were too scared to fly Bondi. 
<laughs> it's definitely a mindset when you get into free flight. If you get a bird with the intention of free fly, your mindset's just a lot more open. Um, but when you already have a bird and you're thinking about free flight, it's much harder. You're kind of like, oh, my baby, I can't imagine just taking it outside. And that's kind of where we were at with Bondi. So seeing Bandit do it gave us the confidence to eventually um, get Bondi outside as well. And then we got our three macaws at the same time. Um, and after our macaws, gosh, which birds did I work with? I'm having a hard time remembering. We did a lot of free flight at that point. Um, and project birds just tend to come up. It's just something that happens, either a friend asks or a situation just occurs where it's like, yeah, that could, that could happen, that could be good. And I just made sure that I worked with birds that I hadn't worked with before. One of the things that I recommend to people to do if they're interested in bird training is just go to a parrot rescue, a parrot sanctuary, even your local animal rescue, and just start offering to walk the dogs, offering to take care of the birds. Um, you can notice just through certain ways that you feed a bird or care for a bird that you can start teaching them to station, which just means go to a specific spot before they get their food. Um, they do that a lot in zoos to keep everybody safe. The animals are taught to go to a specific area and then they know that their food's coming and that's so that parts of the areas can be closed off and stuff. Um, but I honestly, I would just recommend either fostering a bird or working with your neighbor or friend's bird and just start testing the waters with your training. Um, for me, I that's all I did. It was just put my, what I thought I knew to use and to be honest, training a bird is different every single time. The process is different. So those of you that follow me routinely will see that the methods I used for Rasta, the training techniques are the same, but how I get the bird to respond to it is different. So Rasta was severely fearful. He was just scared of everything. So I had to do things in a way where he was constantly choosing, everything was completely hands off. Um, and I was still doing target training, I was still doing flight training, but it was in a completely different way that I enticed him because everything was stemming from fear. Whereas Chi Chi was fearless, <laughs> he was all over the place, and so getting him to focus was completely different. Um, and even to Morgan, she was completely different because of her handicap and because every bird comes from a different scenario you're going to do target training, but how you get there is going to be different. So you're gonna take a different path with each bird. Um, and that's why it's so hard when people are like, how do I flight train my bird? That's not an easy answer. If your bird was previously clipped and fell a lot, it's gonna have a fear of flying because it's not gonna trust its wings and rightfully so. Um, and so you have to take a much slower approach and you have to realize that if your bird is 20 and has never flown before, that means it's never used those muscles before. So the first time that you start formally flight training, it's gonna hurt, it's gonna be sore, like you just worked out for the first time in 20 years. Um, it's gonna really be sore. And so I like taking that approach incredibly slowly where it's all the bird's choice and the bird doesn't even realize the exercise is happening um, so that you can have that slow progression and so that you're not formally training, it's not associated with you necessarily, It's the bird's choice. So the way I go about it is differently. Whereas Storm, he actually started flight training out of aggression. So he wanted to go and attack Dave, my husband. And so originally, since that was the only way that he would fly, I let it happen so that he would fly to get into shape. And then after a while, I had to associate it into a positive. So it was no longer flying to attack. It was flying to come to me. It was flying to hang out. It's flying to get a treat. Um, and it was no longer associated as like an attack mode sort of thing. So, and then with a baby bird, it just happens naturally and you have to know what things to reinforce, when to let the bird fail, because a lot of people are like baby birds, it crashes over there in the corner and they want to go rescue it. And um, there's just certain aspects of baby birdness that you have to, you have to allow failure with all aspects of training and that can be really hard for some people. Um, you saw even with the Morgan series, allowing her to fail was when she succeeded the most. If she hadn't failed, she wouldn't be learning. So it's a very important balance to find. But flight training, even our free flight students, we've taught everyone totally differently. 
For example, uh, Blue and Gold Macaw Sunshine, who is uh, belongs to Claudia, she took nine months to train. She was clipped previously. I think she was nine months old when we started her six months, something like that. But she took nine months of indoor flight training to get her to successfully fly outside. A blue-throated macaw who was a few years old, um, never clipped, took two months. Two months to free flight train. That's the fastest we've ever had it happen um, by a student. There was also a Moluccan cockatoo we worked with who I think was over 10 or 15 years old and he took nine months. Um, most people with their birds, if they're not clipped, three months. Uh, it's just, it's completely different. And to be honest, the people that succeeded in the two months were because they listened to everything we said and they didn't question it. A lot of the time training takes a long time is because you have people challenging your ideas and aspects or implementing different ideas that they think will work. And, uh, and it gets really complicated because there's a certain, there's a certain path you have to take and certain milestones you have to hit in a specific order in order to properly build the bird's confidence and recall. And um, if those are skipped, then there's sloppy moments in there that can get really messed up and disjointed. So, wee, you handsome guy. But um, yeah, as far as, I hope that answers how I became a trainer. Basically, my husband already had birdtricks.com and, and just taught me everything. And then I just kind of went out on my own oh. based on whoever our clients were and I asked to work with birds. And if I didn't have the opportunity to do that, I would have probably volunteered at rescues or volunteered at bird stores anywhere and just trained birds or even other animals. So I consulted with trainers that trained eagles for shows. Um, that's where I learned about random rewarding. <clears throat> and then I actually consulted with some dolphin uh. and killer whale trainers because I thought, what's an animal you couldn't force, even if you wanted uh. to? Like, what is an animal that you would have to train in using the best methods possible? Uh. Um, and I thought a dolphin or a killer whale because, well, damn. <laughs> and, um, and it was really, really cool. You know, one of the things, one of the huge, huge takeaways I learned from a uh, killer whale trainer was he said that the one day this, I think it was a killer whale or it was a dolphin. Now I can't remember which one it was, but either way, the, <laughs> I'll just say the whale didn't like one of the trainers. So anytime this trainer would come in for their shift to train the whale, the whale would go down to the bottom of the tank and just stay there because they can hold their breath so long. And they'd stay there. And they knew that the training session was only 30 minutes and they could just stay at the bottom of the tank and not have to interact with this trainer. Well, another trainer was able to then put that on cue, that behavior, put it on cue. So they were reinforcing it and they were asking for it. So now the whale was like, ah, crap, well, this isn't fun. And, and it was trained. And that's kind of the same approach that we have to um, specifically free flight. If our, like Tusa, one of his very first flights, he ended up in a tree and we were like, oh, darn it. We try to avoid that on the first, on the first outing and we didn't. So he ended up in a tree. So what we did from that point on is every session we started, we would start him from a tree. It wasn't like the forbidden tree. He can, he can never go there. He's never allowed there because then an animal, just like a kid, wants it more because they're being told they're not allowed. <laughs> Instead, we actually put him in the tree and then asked him to come back. And it was the first thing in the first part of the session. And so it just instilled in him like, oh, okay. So that's kind of approach to a lot of things and was a huge eye-opening thing. I was just like, wow, behavior you don't want, you can put it on cue. It's just like when a bird says a bad word that you don't wanna hear. If you put it on cue, yes, you're gonna go through an, a, a burst of hearing that word a ton, but then eventually you're gonna be able to phase it out because you're just gonna cue it once a month or however often you need to, you can slowly wean it back and replace it with other things you do wanna hear. So eventually the bird's like, mm, I get, better things when I say these, when I do these vocalizations. So there's been a lot of takeaways from other trainers and other types of training. Um, targeting is something that's just universal. They use targeting to get horses into trailers. So when a horse is fearful of going into a trailer, they just put a target 
And suddenly the horse is like, oh, I'm touching a target. I'm not entering a trailer, even though they're doing both. Um, so targeting is incredibly powerful. It's also how they teach the dolphins to do flips and things like that. So it's a, it's an incredibly powerful thing. If you've ever been to an animal show, most likely you've seen an animal target and it's an incredibly powerful thing, which is why it's the very first thing that we teach. Even people who decide not to do flight training, if they've at least done target training, we've had people be able to target their bird out of a tree. So they're just there with the stick at the bottom of the tree and the bird's finding how to climb their way down. Um, incredibly powerful training technique. So I would say learn as much as you can and then test yourself. Go train your, train your dog. Train your dog how to sit. Train your dog how to lay down. Train it how to roll over. Train it how to shake. Um, just train all those sorts of things because Trick training is gonna help you get better with the clicker. It's gonna help you get better with your handling of your treats and your response time. It's also gonna help you shape behaviors, which is really incredibly important. Um, and it's gonna help you learn the animal. So just by seeing how it responds, you know, there's a lot of different ways to work with animals. With Rasta, he hated hands so much that I had to put the treat in a dish and hold the dish out every single time or drop a treat in a dish for him to go get. Um, I could not deliver the treat by hand until much later on working with him. So there's a lot of variations. Training can be frustrating, so definitely step back. Videotape your sessions so that you can critique yourself. This is something I do with clients when I've worked with them a certain amount of time. I expect them to be able to watch their own training video, make their own notes about what they did right and what they did wrong. And then I watch their video, I make my notes, and then I compare our notes. And I just had a super proud moment with a client whose notes were superior to mine. She caught things that I wasn't even being hard on her about. She was harder on herself than I was. Um, so that's a great test of, of how you're doing is just by constantly analyzing yourself. And remember to pat, pat yourself on the back too. So if you have a strength, point it out for yourself because otherwise it can get really discouraging. Um, and I would say start with an easier project. So don't take on a bird that's gonna challenge you to the point where you feel like you can't make any progress. Um, yeah, just make sure that you have some wins but you have some fails and realize that failure is just going to teach you more. So um, yeah, it's gonna teach you boundaries and limitations and every bird's limitations are different. You're kinda of out of the frame, bud. You're kind of out of the frame. <laughs> Hi. I love you. I love you. You've been super good. Oh, I dropped one. Moment for you. <laughs>